It's that time again. It's the Berkey and the Badger Board Game Babble Show. It's going to get wild. It's going to get wacky. It might even get a little zany. We're going to talk about board games and the board game industry. And, you know, we might talk about anything else we want to talk about. Hey, hey, hey. Hey, hey. How are you doing? It's, I'm doing well. It's the Berkey and it's the Badger. <laughs> and welcome, Babbleites, to the Board Game Babble Show with your wonderful king from the kingdom of Babylon, King Berkey. And of course, this elegant podcast is streamed live via YouTube, right from Babylon, you know. And it is yeah. even broadcast to Facebook. So you can join us live if you're just tuning in. And I would like to welcome the ever enjoyable, the talented, the wonderful court gesture, Sir Badger the Brave. Welcome. Hello, hello, hello Sawyer. How are you keeping? Wunderbar. You're looking wonderful. That beard yes. is ever so graceful and, and does a, a fine job of d displaying your effervescence and your and your supremeness and and it displays my lunch <laughs> the bits that escapes <laughs> my grandkids they can't uh, when they see me they just love to grab a hold of that baby and they laugh and they laugh we have so much fun <laughs> <laughs> i haven't shaved since november so i'm like there was no shave november and i thought hey i ain't got anywhere to go <laughs> That's I'll a let, new one. I'm gonna let this baby go. No shave November. Ah, it's I'm kind just... of an upper Midwest thing because a lot of times that's that starts to be the fall hunting season. So people are getting ready for the winter and they're gonna bear up and and we've had some crazy, crazy twenty two below zero Fahrenheit weather. Wind chills even higher than that. I mean, I've I've literally had to resort to putting on a hoodie. <laughs> What's wrong with that? Well, you know, normally it's t-shirt weather. If we got 20 degrees above zero, put on your t-shirt and shorts, we're good to go. But <laughs> yeah, that, that's surprisingly cold. I think it says on here, yeah, minus 23 Celsius in Fergus Falls. Yeah, it's 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 actually pretty brutal. I was this last weekend we were making sausage. It's kind of a family tradition. We have a five generation German sausage recipe that we normally make. You're minus three. Wow, that's still yeah. cold. Yeah. And we we were actually making summer sausage, which we smoke in the smoker, and then we made uh, old fashioned wieners with with uh, high temperature cheese. And then we also made a bunch of venison sticks, pepper sticks and so forth. Well, we had to smoke them. Well, the problem was it was so cold outside. I had to bundle up with all my stuff to go out there just to stand for five minutes. And then you're rotating the meat in the smoker. And, and I couldn't keep the temperature up in my smoker. So it took, I was up till 3 a.m. in the morning smoking meat out in 22 below zero. Wow. But it's all yeah. worth it, baby. It's all worth it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, everything is worth it. You put that much effort into something, it's bound to be worth it <laughs> in, in some shape or form. Hey, Rick Artloff is in the kingdom. Welcome, oh. Rick. Good to see you, brother. Pull up a throne next to the king and, and enjoy the chat. And little Don is here. Somewhere he's lurking. Yeah. I think he. I think he went to the little king's room. Um. <laughs> he told me a story about his his beloved pet soiling his game topper map. <gasps> oh, I had serious thoughts to make a snide comment, but I did not. But obviously, those mats are so uh, well what, covered. That um, I'm sure it washed off quite easily. I I think he probably was able to take care of it because they are they are polyester tops, so you can clean them. Mm. Yeah, but yeah, but um, other than that, you know, hanging out in the cold weather, I have had an opportunity to actually do a little bit of ice fishing. Oh, and I don't remember if I sent you pictures about this, but 
I, I bought an old fish house that was on a camper frame. And then I actually built, I had some old aluminum that was out of tolerance from our game toppers. And I made a portable game topper that hinges on the wall and folds up. So when we go out to the fish house, I'm actually able to play games on the game topper while we're ice fishing. <laughs> yes, you, you. we showed pictures of that last time. Okay, we did. I couldn't remember yeah. if we had talked about that. but Yes, we did indeed. So do you want to uh, go ahead? That's basically what I've been doing in Babylon. But do you, before you get into what you're doing, do you want to tell everybody a little bit about what we're doing on the show today? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 84. We've we've gone ahead of ourselves because we haven't spoken for a while, and it's like, wow, this is this is nice to, to chat and, and see each other. Um, so, Absolutely. yeah, we are going to quickly, maybe maybe extendedly, uh, continue to keep talking about what's been happening in Barrelot before doing a roundup of rumors <laughs> in the things that make the king go, hmm. Mm. Um, and then we're going to jump into a bit of uh, 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 first impressions. That's it. It's not written down. I was just trying to think. Yes, it is written first down. Impression. Yeah, first impressions of new games in our good, the not so bad and ugly section. Yeah, before. So ugly. Yes, it's an echo in here. Maybe I've turned the microphone. That's up ugly. Here's a microphone. That's anyway, so bad. Uh, <laughs> it's very good. <laughs> and then we're going to round up with our babble suck section about babble, box babble sizes. suction. Bob, suction. Bob, babble suction. I like babble suction. Yeah, <laughs> the words babble, just come out of your mouth. Babble suck. Babble suck. You get the hoover and you suck them out. And so you don't have to really say anything. You just hold your mouth open and the words just come out. Oh, so, yeah, is bigger, like better? <laughs> is bigger, better? Is bigger, better? No, that's bigger. It's not. That's not is bigger, better. Read the script. It's go is, big or go home, baby. Yeah, but is bigger, better? Well, of course. But, yeah. you know, so I got a funny story. So we're making sausage. Oh, My grandson... Philip is there and we're cutting the venison strips, but we have certain freezer bags and we need to make sure they fit inside the freezer bags when we vacuum pack them. Well, the lengths were getting longer and longer and Philip goes, grandpa, you got, you're cutting those too long. He's four now. Okay. Hmm. And I said, yeah, but go big or go home. <laughs> and he looked up at me and he goes, you know, grandpa, you're right about that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I was wondering where the 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 phrase for the show came from. I was just like, is that an American expression or? It it is an American expression. I think it's kind of like you know, if you're going to do something, do it with all your heart. Do go big or go home. You know, don't oh. don't don't do it halfway. Just go yeah. for it. Go big or go home. Well, that's kind of what we're talking about with this episode regarding big boxes and big games and these kind of things. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. No. But it was sure no. it was sure funny seeing him go, you know, Grandpa, I think you're right about that. <laughs> Can you put fish in sausages? Oh, fish sausage. I've never had fish sausage. I've had fish taco, but not fish sausage. I don't oh. think it would be enjoyable. No. No. That probably explains why I've never heard of a fish sausage before. Yeah, it's it's too fishy and spoily and mm. rubbery mm. after you cook it. Yeah, fish, but it, it'd, be, it'd be, be perfect for me. There'd be no bones in it. That'd be that'd be for sure. Sure, it'd just be skin. <laughs> and Darth is in the castle, and he said, "As a dad, I can confirm that the wisdom of the four-year-old is priceless." Yes, absolutely priceless. <laughs> there he is. <laughs> welcome, welcome, Darth. All right. Well, so what's been going on in your neck of the kingdom, sir? Oh, my neck of the kingdom. Um, well, we're having, as we were talking about the cold, um, we're having our last frost, hopefully our last frost of the year. Um, it's been extremely nice weather. We've had like a, a springtime before springtime, but now it's dropped to the, the little cold and then it's going to jump back to springtime after. This, the world is getting crazy. Global warming is possibly a thing um but uh yes i've been here working working and working and working probably harder than i've ever worked 
most of my life, but not physically, which is a change. Um, working like a dog. I've been working, working like nine to five. What a because way to make a living. coming out very soon, and the first of March is um, a new soundtrack for a board game called Titan from Holy Grail Games, which is cool. It's finished. It's in the bag, baby. It's waiting to just drop on March, which is going to be the same time that the game is actually going to start being delivered. Um, so if you're a backer of Titan, expect it in March sometime. Um, cool. Yeah. And then very, very, very quickly after that, it's going to be the Kemet soundtrack, which should be in April. I say should be because I am still working on it. I am a bit behind. These Kickstarters, like, moved a little. So Titan was a bit delayed, and Kemet was a bit in advance, which which put these two soundtracks back to back, even though when I agreed to do them, there was an Apple amount of time between them so i thought i could do that one and then when that's finished i put that in the bag i can do the second one <laughs> it's been like uh two at the same time so uh, that on top of all the other stuff that i've been doing with sirenscape is is absorbed a lot of my time um and gaming ah gaming yes play i've been games i've been gaming with the sirenscape team oh cool because they are big role players, we play online because uh, one of us lives in Australia, one of us lives in Germany, one of us lives here in France, one of us lives in the UK, and one of us lives in the States. So there's five of us. And so we have to find this perfect time where we can all play together. And so we've been playing together for a little while now, every week, um, on some Dungeons & Dragons, which is which is playing. Which is, <laughs> I've yeah, played more absolutely. Dungeons and Dragons. I've played more Dungeons and Dragons than board games so far this year. It's incredible. Um, but um, yeah, I've enjoyed myself. I'm not, I've not played a lot of Dungeons and Dragons in my life, so the rules are still, you know, which which skill am I using for this and whatever. But I am very much into the role playing, and I've developed this really interesting character who kind of is like the odd man out, but. <laughs> When am I never the odd man now? <laughs> so, yeah. So I've been busy, 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 busy with lots of music. But the, the good thing is that you'll be able to appreciate it after these what, seven, eight months of hard work that I've been pumping into these soundtracks. So, uh, Well, I love your music. It's uh, just adding that ambiance and all the sound effects that you incorporate um, – I was I was really enthralled with when you did the Abyss soundtrack. It was mm. just I could hear the bubbles of the depth of the water, yeah. uh, and, and it just again it creates that extra level of immersion that is so fun, right? Yeah, and you wait until you hear Titan because on Titan there are several parts of the, the planet which you get to explore. You get to explore the dark side where there's rarely a, a machine that goes past, and but you can hear like falling stars and you can hear dust storms blowing up. And you can also hear your breath inside the mask as you're walking across the surface. But then there's the control room. So you can hang out in the control room and listen to all the, the jibber jabber that's going on. You know, the, the, the controllers saying, uh, uh, tie up the control and we're coming in for a landing now and we're going to ship all this stuff up. And then we're going we're gonna to change these cubes for the other cubes. <laughs> so, um, yeah, there's going to be uh, several different environments um, that you can listen to as well as the music. So uh, you'll have an MP3 version, which you'll be able to stream or, or download, and you'll be able to listen to it like a, like an hour long. Well, it's longer than an hour. Or you can listen to the Sirenscape version where you can pick which control room you want, which ambience you want, and then have that as your background while having some music or no music play over the top. So you've got so different do, ways of doing it. How do, how do people go to Sirenscape to get that? Do they do you subscribe to Sirenscape? And how, how do you do that? Okay. if Sirenscape, is a, you can download it for free, and it comes okay. with a bunch of sound sets that you can download for free. But there will be some that you will have to pay for. If you're a Kickstarter backer, you'll be able to you'll, – you'll get an email, and you'll get a free code to download this free. Um, if you're not a backer, you're going to have to 
invest uh, a little bit extra just to get this sound set. Okay. But that's so, at sirenscape.com. Sirenscape. We'll put that in the show notes. Yes, we should do. Awesome. Now, we didn't we didn't do a poll for the last show, did we? We in did. Guild? We did. Okay. Let's cover we the – we have a Board Game Geek Guild – uh, number 2248, where we periodically will post some polls and uh, go through that with us real quick. Ah, okay. and Paul Grogan is here popping in just to say hi. Well, hi, Paul Grogan. Love your stuff at Gaming Rules Vids. Yay. It's good to love, see you Love too, being buddy. taught games. That's the, the main thing. <laughs> at the moment, I just can't find time to read instructions anymore. So it's nice just to pop a video on for 20 minutes and learn a game. Exactly. Even even one that you've already learned, but you haven't played it in so many years that you've forgotten the rules. Exactly. And Paul does such a great job. I just... Uh, he does. One of the one of the best... It's, it's always so refreshing to Paul's videos because it's we're good friends and it, it, it it's like this reconnection, even though we don't know we're connecting. <laughs> and uh, sadly, this last year, we haven't been to shows with one another, but there's just a little bit of a touch of home when you're able to pop on the video and, and know that, hey, that's my buddy there and that kind of thing. So thanks for all you do, Paul. You do a great job. Yeah. So the poll in our last show, we were talking, we were babbling about, uh, let's read this out. <laughs> we were bab babbling about the things that we're looking forward to in 2021. Um, oh, yeah. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I made kind of a joke poll just for just for fun because I couldn't think of anything. Um, it's just a crazy question about what are your gaming goals for 2021? And yeah. we had some votes. Let's All have a right. look at the results. Results. Okay. The biggest result was at 30% for players playing more solo games, which I think uh, is solo games. what a lot of people <laughs> will be doing forcibly um, without any exception, to be honest with you. I just have such a hard time. I, there, every now and then I want to play a solo game, but I have so much going on in my life that I don't have time. And when mm. I do want to relax, I want to hang out with somebody and, and play games with the family or something. You know, it's like I've got Finding or not Finding Nemo. <laughs> I got Finding Nemo, the board game. Uh, Nemo's War. And I hear everybody saying how awesome that game is. I, I backed it on Kickstarter based on Jamie Keggy's recommendation from the Secret Cabal Gaming Podcast. And uh, I just haven't got to it. But that's mm. one I really would like to try solo. Yeah, yeah. And uh, again, I'll only play a solo game if I know the rules like the back of my hand. So uh, I don't want to start reading how to play, uh, for example, Arkham Horror. Uh, it's been so long since I played it. I'm going to have to read the whole rule book just to get back into that again. Me yeah, yeah. So uh, what else yeah. was on? What else were some of your things? Okay, second highest at 21% was organized regular gaming with a smaller bubble of friends because mm. th that's one of the things that some countries are allowed to do. They're, you're allowed to create a bubble of friends that you can meet uh, and hang and out And you with. play inside of the bubble then? You all jump um, in the bubble, walk in and bubble? Yes, yes. You're sucked into the bubble. Yes, this is a vortex of of extreme strangeness bubble. Okay. <laughs> bubble. bubble bubble all right uh, nine percent <laughs> um build that gaming room that you've always dreamed of oh that would be good well that, you know you've got plenty of time there's no excuse now apart from maybe if your your brick and mortar shop so uh, will shut down so you can't buy the, the the bits that you need if you've got no ikea to buy those those shopping <laughs> units <laughs> Um, I missed one. Uh, Eleven percent. <laughs> Paint your body green and sing "I'm a Barbie Girl in a Barbie World." <laughs> yeah, that's something you'd do. Yep, yep, yeah. That's that's some people's goals for 2021. Well, um, it, it, it's befitting of a gesture to do that. Yeah. Um, Eight percent of people want to design a game. Uh, four percent uh want to wait for the COVID all clear and travel the world gaming. Hmm. 
Yeah. Three uh, percent <laughs> said they want to burn their collection. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like it's frustrating. <laughs> it is frustrating. Um, Six percent said they want to start painting minis. Yeah, that's what Rick said in the chat. He's to yeah. reduce his painting cue from his painting cue of shape. <laughs> and uh, nobody put uh, a, a vote for start using your gaming table to do more jigsaw puzzles or large jigsaw puzzles. That should be large, but I put mine. Hey, s speaking of jigsaw puzzles, I yes. saw Academy Games took some of their amazing art from some of their, their recent games like Freedom, The Underground Railroad, this beautiful artwork and a great game. And then they, one of the, I think it's the Vikings 878. And there was another one, uh, was, it was actually a war game, forgetting the name now, but they turned the artwork into jigsaw puzzles. Oh, well, that was brilliant because I've been hearing a lot of my friends in the, in the retail stores, the board game stores have been selling out of jigsaw puzzles. People are buying jigsaw puzzles like crazy. Mm, I've heard that as well. The jigsaw puzzles have, have gone up the sales of jigsaw puzzles in stores due to the fact that there's nothing else to do. <laughs> well, uh, Uva, Eichert, yeah, Academy Games and Gunther, they, uh, that's a brilliant move. Whoever came up with that idea, I thought that was that's brilliant because it's a it board is. gaming thing and it's a, uh, it's still immersive, you know, for for our hobby and this, you know, that type of thing. And people yeah. like to do uh, puzzles. If if, if Scott Olden ever hears this or watches this, uh, maybe you should do that with those wonderful posters that BGG does. Right. And make them into puzzles. And that would give me an excuse to buy them. And I could say that I'm buying them for my wife and she'll be happy because she and likes doing could, puzzles. You could make the puzzle, then you could decoupage it and frame it. And yeah, it and then I can the put wall. it up in my room so you don't have to look at all my, my cables hanging and my, my Bombayics calendar and, and all my notes of things I, I've got I to do and people got to phone. I don't like the cables behind your head. You look like the board with that headphone set. You look like the board. <laughs> I'm going to plug myself in now. I'm going to get – here we go. I'm gonna plug it in. Where did Animal go? Where's Animal? At, well, he's on the guitar. Yeah. See, Animal's much more enjoyable to look at than your boardiness. Yeah, but I, I've shifted my room around a bit. So, like, the screen has moved about – 42 centimeters to the right and so that's why you, you have this you actually do resemble lucutus of borg slightly <laughs> i am lucutus of borg resistance <laughs> is futile will paul be also says that um i don't think i have a goal for this year now i took january off work to try and accomplish some goals and they aren't over yet but uh i have nothing beyond that well, I think that's the same for well, all of us hardworking people. The only thing that I that I feel pretty good about, I mean, I, I have a goal this year. Of course, we're doing our new Kickstarter. We're going to talk about that in a few moments. But mm -hmm. uh, I want to make the best Kickstarter that we've ever done. I want everything to be better. So I've been working crazy di diligently hard on that. But as far as self-improvement goes, I started uh, doing keto again. Uh, I'll do this regularly. Um, and also some intermittent fasting. And I have now dropped 26 pounds. And yeah, Ooh. so that that has felt good because I was really blowing up and uh, just too sedate, you know, not going anywhere, not doing what I sh exercise that I should, sitting at the computer too many hours working. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, downtime, you snack. And I had to, I had to say no, <laughs> but thankfully I had the the grace to jump into it and uh, and to be able to uh, manage it. And I've been doing it now for about forty days. That's and uh, yeah, I've I've put in over a thousand hours of intermittent fasting, and that's usually about fourteen hours between meals. Um, and then just staying away from sugar and and heavy carbs. And uh, I'm feeling feeling pretty good about that. Now, now I'm hoping as the weather warms up, I'll be able to implement some exercise, so I uh, get that pressure off all my joints. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I started exercising again. It's been a while since 
moderation, but uh, I managed to put on uh, f three kilograms and a bit more, but that's um, about 6.6 .6 pounds. 6.6, that's twice. A kilogram is two pounds. Mm, possibly. <laughs> that's what the internet is telling me. But, wow. uh, yeah, I would love to lose 11 pounds. And so get I, I've lost 52 kilograms. Yeah. That's a bigger number. I like, no, I'm going to say 11, it that way. For... It was 11. Oh, it's 11 kilograms because yeah, I'm doing lost... it backwards. I like the 52 better. Yeah, 26 pounds is 11, nearly 12 kilograms. Oh, man. I thought I had I something lost... good there. Yeah, but it is good. If I could lose that, I'd be at my, my perfect weight. <laughs> the weight I was before I got married. Oh, oh. I, haven't, I haven't been that since I was married. I don't think I'll ever <laughs> see that again. <laughs> hey, oh. Kabuki Kid is in the, in the castle. Welcome, welcome. Pull up your comfy chair and join us. So with that, we will move to our sponsor break. We will indeed. But Who is? Um... This video was made possible with the help of Game Toppers. Upgrade your gaming experience with a Game Topper. There it is. Thank you, sir. Well, I'm getting. This is definitely a, a self-indulgent uh, post in a sense because I'm going to talk about our company, Game Toppers that provides an excellent gaming upgrade to convert your existing table into a high quality board game table with all the functionality of those higher end premium tables. And we have done two full Kickstarters, but we are going to Kickstarter again in, uh, in right now we're scheduling for the first part of April and boy, do we have some exciting new innovations. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the things that we are, doing, and we've been working on this for quite a while, um, and we have several publishers that actually have these in their show kits, but we have engineered a leg kit to convert your existing game topper. If you're a generation two game topper owner or later the new toppers, um, you'll be able to actually put these leg kits underneath your topper to make a full freestanding table. So that is uh, super exciting. Our prototypes have worked great. Uh, AEG and Renegade Game Studios and, and Come On, Simon has uh, these toppers in their show kits, actually. And of course, last year we, we weren't doing that at any conventions except the Gamma Trade Show. Breaking Games had one. Um, but they've performed really brilliantly, so we've done a lot of testing and super excited about that. We also are making a new cover. Well, oh, now you're posting sausage pictures. Oh, I thought they were the legs for the table. Oh, that's the, you know, <laughs> they would be delicious. So not only do they hold up your topper, they sustain you in an emergency situation. And if the table starts to wobble, then you can easily fix it by nibbling on a few of the other legs. <laughs> you have problems with pests, though, and dogs. Dogs. <laughs> They take your table down. It's a sad thing. It is. But <laughs> <laughs> Fresh smoke table legs. Yes, that's a mm. good selling feature. Yeah, um, it smells nice. Uh, but one of the other things that we've been doing is we have a new, uh, our, our game topper uh, mat racks that we have here, they're made out of a three-quarter inch MDF that is more of a commercial grade for countertops and they are powder coated to match our rails. So we've innovated a new cover that goes over all of our game toppers. These will be backward compatible. So you'll be able to have a full dining room table as well. A lot of people were requesting this, super excited about that, but we have new accessories coming and, and enhancements to our collapsible cup holder trays and some amazing new Game mats. I mean, people love our game mats. They're three millimeter premium stitched edge mats. And one of the mats that I, we've got a couple I just wanted to share with you really quick. Uh, Badger has the pictures. But Vincent Dutre, this here that he is showing here is our new Viking, or excuse me, pirate 
theme map from Jaroslav Radecki, who did Reavers of Midgard, but he did our Viking map. He also did our Scythe-inspired resource map and the fantasy map. Uh, this is partially completed. There's going to be water around the island and some other Easter eggs, uh, but it's basically you're looking down on this pirate table with his map unfurled to find the treasure, and it'll be great for those type of pirate games. Uh, the next one that we have is... The wonderful Foundations of Rome map from Arcane Wonders had an amazing campaign. They're our sponsor of our show, but they offered the game Foundations of Rome, and we had our artist, Jaroslav Radecki, who just did the other map you saw, create this beautiful environment for Roman-themed games. And I got to tell you, um, I, I have this map in person as a sample. It's amazing. The, you just can't help but look at it. Um, and so many different Roman themed games that go great with it. And the next one. The last one. This is, uh, I am so excited. This is so gorgeous. This is a map that we're calling the Great Wall. It's ancient China, wonderful for uh, Asian themed games. And the artist is Vincent Dutre. Uh, Vincent and I have developed a friendship and I love, he's one of my favorite board game artists. Uh, I had such an enjoyable time working with him to put together this beautiful map that would, would be really thoughtful, create this environment and we've actually had the opportunity to play a game on this map that we'll show you a little bit later. I sent you some other pictures mm. in an email, uh, but this map is gorgeous. I got to tell you, um, I think this is going to be a huge hit. And anyway, lots of stuff happening on the Kickstarter, a whole bunch more that I'm not going to take time to talk about, but we're looking at April. So you just stay tuned to our Game Topper Facebook group. Um, uh, Game Topper Nation and or Game Toppers LLC. And we'd be happy to talk about all those kind of things. And you can still get a whole bunch of Game Topper product now with some of our packages. We still have some stock, but we've already sold out of all the Mycrofts. And so we have to go again and produce a whole bunch of aluminum. So with that, we will move on to things that make the king go hmm. This is the Board Game News, where King Berkey reflects on some of the current things happening in the board game industry. Some may be good, some may be bad, but they're all things that made our king go, hmm. Ha ha! They things did. Things that make us go, hmm. Well, I have something very interesting. Um, it definitely made me go, hmm. This is came from ICV2. Games Workshop teases Warhammer Age of Sigmar board game. Mm. Okay. I got to tell you, uh, in the words of J.B. Keggy from The Secret Cabal, I can see that people are just jumping out of their pants to get at this one. Uh, okay. Age of Sigmar, I'm not a Warhammer uh, player, so I, I don't have a great reference. Of course, I know what it is and all that kind of stuff. But Age of Sigmar is a huge part of their, their IP. And when Warhammer puts something out, I mean, the Warhammer fans go nuts. They love it. Warhammer fans, I mean, we really made our Mycroft game topper to help people who play large miniature games like Warhammer, because it's four foot by six foot. There's different tournament plays. There are all kinds of things happening in that, that, that area. Well, what was interesting about this, uh, do you remember, Badger, when Dungeons and Dragons, uh, they came out with the, the Lords of Waterdeep, Skullport, and with the Skullport expansion eventually, uh, you yeah. remember when they came out with that game and that created that that buzz in that environment that, oh, finally, we've got kind of a and d themed board game, right? Uh, yeah, though I can remember some more before that. Yeah, well, the, the point that I'm making there is when, when Lords of Waterdeep came out, 
I mean, it was a real full-blown type of board game, Euro mechanics, different things. What made yeah, me it was go different to everything else, wasn't it? That 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 come before it. You you say Dungeons and Dragons, and you had this expectation of adventuring and dungeon crawling and stuff like that. But Waterdeep was not that. Yeah, was it? I think it, yeah. it was it was more in keeping with a lot of the newer uh, worker placement games, you know, the hobby board games, that type of thing. And and it was what well received, I think. Um, I love the game actually with the Skullport expansion. So anyway, um, th this goes on and says something kind of interesting here. It says, uh, Games Workshop will also put out a miniature board game for their new fantasy line Warhammer Age of Sigmar that features Kahagra's Ravengers, I'm probably saying that wrong, versus the Godsworn in a gladiatorial-like arena. In this game, the two armies will use their unique skills to earn a spot in Archon's ever-chosen armies. This game can be used as a gateway product to attract more players to explore the realm of Warhammer Underworlds and Warcry. The game comes with push-fit models, dice, stats, cards, and the game board. The game is for two players, ages 12 and up, in about 30 minutes. Doesn't say any retail price. Okay, okay, that's the thing right there that made me go, hmm. Okay, so they're actually making a mini skirmish game. Now, I realize Warhammer is, is, a, is a war miniatures game, but they've compiled this rather, they talk about it being a board game, but in my mind, it's not, it's not like a Euro hobby board game like I was kind of expecting when I first heard it. So it made me go, hmm. They're actually making a small two versus two combat game. Okay. So I don't know what people think about that. Um, I think it would have been amazing if they actually made a full blown game. But I mean, Warhammer players, maybe they would really like this because this gives them an introduction to more Warhammer. And I don't know enough about what I'm talking about here with Warhammer <laughs> too. <laughs> to, to probably comment. So I think it would be great to hear what people think about that. Yeah, I mean, the way you're describing it, because I knew nothing about it until I saw the notes, um, is it's kind of like the, the Songs of Fire and Ice, which call me they're not doing. They, they've created a battle system, and they've created a bunch of minis, and then you start building up on that. And they've mm -hmm. made it so it, it, it's still classed as a board game, although it is a tactical minis game. Mm -hmm. But I think they're they're appealing to that kind of audience. The board game is that like tactical minis, but want to call it a board game, maybe. Well, and they kind of did that with Blood Bowl too. They came out with kind of a uh, a lesser version of it um, mm. that was kind of an entry level type of of Blood Bowl. So you know that their IPs are huge. I mean, I'm I'm sure this will be wildly successful. And maybe yeah. it brings people more into that that tactical miniature space, if you will, and continues to give more exposure to Games Workshop because they've really done done a lot. But I would have loved to see an actual board game in that universe. Mm -hmm. You know, I shouldn't say actual. It's not that it's not an actual board game, but you know what I'm uh, you know what I'm trying to say. <laughs> I know what you're saying. I mean, <laughs> I'm not saying it well. The other thing is that, that that probably gives them the chance to put it into other stores and not just sell it in their own stores. So or on online at Amazon. So you're not having to go to um, Games Workshop. So, yeah. 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 But they probably do be. that anyway. <laughs> well, that's uh, that's what made me go. Hmm. And yeah. with that, I think we can move right on to our next segment. We're going to talk about some games we played in the good. The not so bad and the ugly. And the burky jerky legs. <laughs> <laughs> Kabuki kid, so funny. <laughs> <laughs>
<sighs> wow. Yeah. That Never was mind. pretty pretty clever there, Sir Badger, making us a nice little video montage. Yes. I'll do what I can with what I've got to work with, us, whatever it is, whatever that expression is. So the good, the not so bad, and the ugly is our first impression segment where we talk about games that we've just recently played and we've never played them before and uh we turn this into a kind of game where we describe the game and then the other has to try and guess what the game is and then uh have to guess whether we think it's a good game which is a game that, that you jump to if someone asked you to play it uh a not so bad game which is a game that you could take or leave or an ugly game which is a game that you would ignore like um like a smelly sausage legged table. <laughs> oh, you don't ignore that. <laughs> no, you, you don't in, ignore that. You invite your friends and family over and you have at it. Yeah, and then you, you put beer as well, so beer and sausage. Mm. <laughs> so um I've only played one new game since our last show. <laughs> okay. How many have you played? Three. Okay. This, this many. That many. Okay. This, this many, three. Yeah, you fire ahead then with game number one. Game number one. Okay, this is this is a game. It's kind of interesting. I'm going to give you a little clue. Given our topic today, this would be considered a big box game. Okay, mm. Mm. Um, it has miniatures in it. Mm. It has. Uh, it, it's more of a worker placement type of resource management type of game, but there's combat. There's a little bit of area control-ish type of features to it. Uh, you're collecting a lot of different uh, resources to accomplish different tasks. And then it has an engine building uh, component to it so that you can build on that. But there's a little bit of a race to see who's going to win. So do you have an idea of what I've been playing? That could be a thousand games. <laughs> Cry Havoc. Um, Cry uh, Havoc! Unleash the dogs of war! Something of Midgar, Champions of Midgar. No. no. Um, Call of Cthulhu. No, no, no. 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 There's probably Not a... a Cue the joke about the Germans show three on their fingers for their team. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, no, you're not correct. I wonder if anybody in the chat knows what I'm talking about. It was a pretty brief overview. It was. I was trying to get it's a big. It was, it was a big Kickstarter. And we actually happened to make the game mat for this company. The company's name is... Breaking games. Mm. Still don't know, huh? No. Is it um, War of the Sausages? <laughs> it's the game Dwellings of Eldervale. Okay. Yeah, D Dwellings of Eldervale, it basically, you're starting out and you have a, a certain amount of workers that you're going to send out. You start out with three, but then you can get a dragon and you can get a wizard and you can get a warrior and you're, they all have different capabilities. You have a player card that allows you, a player board that allows you to pick one of the two sides and it'll give you different abilities depending on which workers you're actually going to get out on the board. And you have portals, which allows you to build dwellings. You have uh, different spaces that allow you to expand uh, the kingdom of Everdale. And by doing so, when you go there, you collect different resources. Um, you collect all these different resources to purchase these uh, player cards. These, these cards that you purchase allow you to have engine building capabilities so that you can upgrade instead of getting one hammer, you could get two hammers or you could get gems or different things of that nature. 
Uh, there's also a combat element that where you can compete with one another for different spots. And then sometimes the people go to the underworld, but sometimes you can get points for going to the underworld. You also have a great big scoring track where if depending on if it, if you're in these different elements that are in the game, it allows you if you I sent you an email with a couple of pictures uh, of the game on our uh, Dwellings of Eldervale game map also too. Um, beautiful components. These components are truly stellar. Peter Vaughn and the, the team at Breaking Games, man, they went all out on this thing. It's spectacular. The way the form-fitted game trays are, the, the component miniatures, I mean, it's, it's really an amazing production. What do you think I think about this game? Okay. Um, you are a blank canvas hidden behind that beard. <laughs> um, I think you say that it's not so bad. Ah, I, I, you fell for the classic blunder. First, we and not, never go to war with a Sicilian when death is on the line. Hmm. But little little less known than that is don't look at my face when i'm trying to trick you about this <laughs> no i loved it okay uh we had the opportunity to play it three times we only got to play it at three players so i think it would be yeah three players that many uh i think it would be better with four players uh i i think the combat and so forth would, would be just a little better. Uh, but the gameplay is just, I, I mean, the replayability is amazing. I, you could just keep playing this. There's all these different trays and different, different uh, factions that you can play. Uh, the game is ever changing. Um, I really like the resource management. It, it was not hard to learn. Uh, the rule book, Josiah read the rule book, of course, but yeah. um, the teach of the game was pretty simple. After playing it one time, I could teach the game. Uh, the production's amazing. I mean, it's just like out of this world, wonderful. Um, I don't know if I would say it's my number one or top top 10 worker placement games. I don't know yet about that, uh, but I liked it a lot. And so I think it's a great game. Um, and I'm not saying that because we did the mat. I mean, the mat is gorgeous, but, and I love, you know, the, the immersion of this game, because it's produced so well, act really elevates it for me personally. But I thought the gameplay was great. Every, all, we all enjoyed it. We all really okay. liked it. There's a little bit of take that in there. There's certain cards that can do different things. And uh, if you don't like any take that, you know, that's would be the only negative that I could say about it. But it, it, it seemed balanced. There didn't seem to be any major problem. Okay. Nice. Yeah. So, a new game that I've just played for the first time. Um, I've played this with my three-year-old. Um, so, it's a very simple game. In the game, you are trying to escape with the treasure from an island before a ghost pirate and his fleet of pirate ships can stop you. In this game, it's very, very simplistically a memory game with a bit of dice rolling, so there's a bit of luck and a little bit of uh, kind of resources because you are basically as a memory game uh, searching the waters to try and find weapons well not weapons you're trying to find gold pieces to pay for pirates who will then attack these ghost ships and then hopefully defeat them so you can escape safely off the island hmm hmm this, this isn't this isn't an older game is it it's uh, it's not that old. It's about probably about three or four years old. Um, I remember I actually uh, translated the rules for the designer, and um, I made myself laugh when I looked at the game and I thought, "Oh, that's that game that I translate the rules for." <laughs> well, I was going to say Pirates Cove, but that's much older, and that's not quite that. I don't know mm. if I know what this is. No, you won't know because it's a Haber game. It's uh, called 
la légende de Captain, Captain Bob Blanche. Oh, or, or, la, 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 or something else. So it's yeah. a Haber game by uh, uh, some, a designer I know called Cyril Fay, who um, asked me to translate the rules for him so he okay. could get it to publish by Haber. And it was, which was great. Let's have a look at the English name. Oh, I haven't got my glasses. Where are my glasses? It's called Escape from Pirate Cove in English. Escape from Pirate Cove. I was kind of right. Wrong game, but yeah, partially yeah. right. <laughs> so there you go. What do you think? I think of. Um, I think you like a lot of these these simpler kids games that you get to play with your kids. And uh, if you translated the rules, you probably know it pretty well. I, I think you say it's a good game. Mm, it's. <laughs> I think I played it a bit too much. That's the problem. <laughs> the first few times were fine. And then it just becomes, you know, after the sixth, seventh play, you know, on the same, you know, hour, um, it does become. <laughs> but it is a solid, simple game that children can pick up. It's very simple. You roll a dice. That's how many tokens you can turn over. You reveal them. They're either... Um, bad ones which will advance the ghost pirate towards the ships or they are the pirate ships themselves so you can either attack them and there's a bit of luck you can flip a coin to see if you manage to defeat them or not or you can run away from them which does nothing but basically you're just trying to defeat four ghost ships and it's very simple you need to find a token which is a gold coin and after you find the gold coin you need to find one with the pirate and again it's memory so even if you find the pirate one you can put it down and go, remember that's there, Robin. And yet he will still go and pick up another one. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, that's basically it. It's a memory game. It's very simple. Um, but it, it, he found it, it intriguingly fun. And it's it's just a cooperative, simple, light game with a bit of luck and a bit of deduction. So there Great. you have it. Yeah. The yeah, you love the Capitaine Blanc, Barbe Blanche. From Haba. From I, haven't, Haba. I, don't, I don't know if I've seen that uh, in the States yet. Possibly. I mean, that might Possibly. be a good one. My grandkids would, I think, like that too. Yeah. We, we got them for Christmas. We got them Click Clack Lumberjack and oh, yeah. Ice Cool. No. And Elizabeth is three and uh, Philip is four. And then little Charlie is just now one years old or 14 months. And uh, they'll do click clack lumberjack, and Charlie will laugh and laugh every time he hits that thing, and <laughs> and they can't wait to play ice cool. They love flicking those little penguins, you know. They are cool. <laughs> All right, well, we'll do one more, and we have a special guest coming on the show in just a few minutes. Our our very own good friend. Dan King, the Game Boy Geek, is going to be joining us in just a little bit to go through our 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 uh, babble topic. I think he's in the green room right now. Is he in the green room? He's, he's in, in the green room. room. I can eat. see him down here. He's smiling. He's oh, and smiling. he's eating green things, right? Or did he? He's, he's doing some funny green? faces. No, oh, I missed oh, him. There, 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 there he is. <laughs> I saw him. Oh, there, there he is. <laughs> It's like peekaboo. It's like I do this with the kids. This is yeah. fun. Okay, another game. Wait. <laughs> yes, your your next game. Okay, two player game. Got mm -hmm. to play it with my daughter Gabrielle. She was home this last weekend, and it's it's an older game, uh, not super old, but it's a two player game, and you are going between developing these little connections between islands. Mm-hmm. And you're trying to get the majority of connections between these islands to get to get the majority, which gives you control of the island. And at the end of each of the three rounds that are played, you're going to get points. The points kind of increase. The first round, you get one point, whoever has the majority of the islands. It's the second uh, round, you get two points. And then you get how many points are more than your opponent. So if one opponent had five influence and one opponent had three influence, you would get a net two points. And whoever wins the game, it takes about 45 minutes. It's a two player game. Uh, what do you think this game is? That sounds so familiar. Ah, uh, there's Dragon Island. 
but that's four players. Oh, it uh, it's it's small. Yep. Uh, but produced well, but it's a small box. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking of Islos as well, but that's for five players, and it's boats going between islands, not not building bridges. Mm, Kabuki doesn't seem to know. She hasn't played that one. Um, I'm gonna I'm going to pass. Okay, this is from the company uh, Thames and Cosmos. And okay. they have a whole bunch of games that are this size. I have a whole stack of them. I think I've got about eight or nine of them. Shelf of shame. Yeah. <laughs> Most of them I've played. There's a couple I haven't played. Oh, that's good. Lost Cities. Yep. Is okay. one of their, their games in that kind of look and feel. Um, this is the game Kahuna. Ah. Kahuna. Yeah, yeah it's in their two-player line. And basically, you are getting these cards with a, a type of a ticket to ride uh, card set collection. You place one of the cards, say you want to go Aloha to the island. No, nope, that's not it. Um, there you go. And say you want to go to the big island, upper left there is, is Aloha. You can put down Aloha card, you get to put a bridge there. In order to have a bridge removed, you have to have two of those cards, but it can be a card that is two Aloha cards or a car, one Aloha and one card that's connected to another island uh, to get the pair. But it takes a pair to remove it. Well, when you remove it, a bridge, uh, you can actually lose the influence. Uh, you can, if you had control of the island and you remove a, a bridge that causes you to lose influence, you actually have to lose the bridges that are connected to those places. So it's very tricky uh, to do that. It, it plays pretty quickly. It's fairly easy to explain. What do you think I think about this game? I think you think it's a good game because I, I was tempted to play it once and I it sounded really good. It looks it looks like a nice kind of back and forth between two players. I think you you you, you think it's good. Yeah. Got you again. I think it's not so bad. <laughs> um the reason I'm, I'm going to say it. it's it's not so bad is uh it's just really fiddly. Um Ooh. and when I say fiddly Keeping track of when you take when you place to get to get an a bridge, and then to make sure that you don't make a mistake and not count it correctly and take off any other bridges that are influenced. Uh, we were constantly fighting with that back and forth. Oh, we should have taken that one off. Mm -hmm. And so we played it. Have played it several times. It's not that it's a bad game by any means. Um, and in fact, I, th I think it's pretty well designed. I forget the designer actually. Um, I just found that it was a little fiddly. So it's not like I'm jonesing to play this whenever I can, but if I needed a two player game that I could teach real quick, there's nothing wrong with it. I think it's just not so bad. Okay. Um, yeah. but I don't think it's great. This is an awesome game. I can't wait to play it. Okay. Um, Gunta it's a good game though. The designer. Okay. Well, that is my thought on Kahuna from Thames and Cosmos. I really love a lot of their games. So this one just fell a little short for me, but, you know, it doesn't mean it's a bad game. No. And with that. With that, let's go to our sponsor, Arcane Wonders. Okay. Dan King's in the waiting. <laughs> -na 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 -na. Arcane Wonders. <laughs> All right. Arcane Wonders uh, has been sponsoring Burke cool. and Badger Board Game Babble for quite some time. Did you have a – you didn't have a video play, do you? No. No, no. Um, they have made some of some of my favorite games. They, they have become a part of – the Dice Tower Essential line of games, of course, Sheriff of Nottingham, one of my favorite games of all time. Have a dear love for that. Spoils of War is another game. Uh, Royals, uh, Good Critters, I have several of them back here. Volcanic Isle, Dragon Scales, Good Critters. 
They have the game Smartphone and Smartphone Inc., but they have a brand new deduction game called Sherlock 13. Uh, that you can go to the Arcane Wonders website and you can see all about uh, Sherlock uh, 13. I have, let's see. Uh, and also uh, Sherlock 13, it's basically a deduction game card driven and it it has a little bit of a feel like clue where you're trying to guess who done it and there's certain cards that are pulled out but the mechanism is different and and this is an older game that they've brought back and have retweaked out um it's going to be available shortly they are not going to kickstarter with this there you can see the graphics and the star wars version <laughs> <laughs> a star wars version of it wow i didn't see that uh, anyway, Ar Arcane Wonders puts a lot of thought and dedication into the games that they produce. Um, I, I have no doubt that this will be a good one. I haven't played it. I uh, just saw a little bit about that, but you can go to arcanewonders.com, get a little bit more feel of what's happening there. But they also have Aquatica Cold Waters expansion that's coming out next. Uh, again, I haven't had the opportunity to play Aquatica, but Aquatica is getting really great reviews. It's readily available now, and they're also going to be coming out with that ex expansion. You can still late pledge for Freedom 5. Uh, this, is, this is the redone game by Richard Launius and the Stadler Brothers. You can go to late pledge for Freedom 5, and it's uh, an amazing... Uh, production value there that you can still get in all the gamer goodness that's that. So go to arcanewonders.com. And with that, we have joining us the illustrious, the wonderful, the talented, the saxophone playing Dan King, the Game Boy Geek. Welcome, Danny. You guys do the best introductions ever. You guys are you guys way overhyped this. Did we? <laughs> Oh, we I didn't have know. the fanfare. There was the fanfare. There was no fanfare. We normally do that, but... Well, the serenade. Right. We could have had the saxophone serenade. I know, right? Yeah. Where did you come up with that anyway? What? I don't know. You know what it was is that everyone kept asking me because I was I used to play I used to play with a band that was that had won a national song contest and we were on the road playing in the West Coast a lot. And when that ended, I started doing videos uh, for board games and then Everyone asked me, are you still playing a saxophone? I said, no, I'm just too busy with the board game thing. And so then I thought, well, maybe there's a way I could integrate my love for music with fitting in a little bit of time with it as I'm doing the board game stuff. Then out came the saxophone sound. Plus, I would also get like people would, I would always say, you know, hey, I, you know, when, when I keep one, I have to get rid of one. And so then I just made it a thing. Like if it, if it got inducted, there you go. Saxophone serenade allowed me to like. Sadly, it's like the only time I'm picking up the horn these days. But mm. uh, you know, when there's more time, I'll, I'll be able to play a little more. Yeah, I love it. I think it's it's kind of like your stamp of approval on a game. It's kind of like the yes. dice tower gavel coming down. You play the, and it just it adds is. a little. Sometimes it causes problems though, because I'll have people comment or message me and be like, "Hey, you were really positive about this game, but it didn't get sacked on Saturday. Why not?" And I'm like, "Well." Unfortunately, there's a lot of like weird little factors that play into it that shouldn't matter whether you would like the game or not. Like um, the box was just speaking of box sizes and big boxes is today. Um, it's like, you know what? Like if I keep this, I have to get something that's like the same, get rid of the same box size. Or I, I really like this game, but there's one that does something somewhat similar that I love. And so I probably won't get it to the table much. You know, so it's like sometimes it's like these little subjective things. I probably mm. should come up with a more objective way of giving some sort of recommendation seal. Mm -hmm. uh, but for now, it's just the saxophone Saturday because it's cool and it's original and it's fun and what, uh, you know, what have you. Oh, As yeah, the collection I, I gets bigger, it. you get a bit more kind of refined in your in, in, in what you're going to keep and, and why you like it so much. I think that's what it is. Yeah, I think so. By the way, Berkey, I was backstage listening to your last game uh, description and I had guessed what it was, but I couldn't remember their name. I described it to... To, uh, to Badger on the, uh, on the, on the, on chat. the chat. And I couldn't remember the name, but I will echo what you said. I, my thoughts are pretty much exactly what you said about the game. So there you hmm. have it. Yeah, we, Dan, uh, Darth, uh, Darth Grader, <laughs> great, <laughs> great handle, Darth Grader. He said, uh, Kahuna is one of those games that leaves me with an odd feeling. I bought it thinking my wife would like it, and we played it at, 
and it was meh with a resounding, or it was met with a resounding meh by my better half. Sold it soon after. Yeah, it's kind of, I got that same kind of feeling, and yet, I don't know, it's it's one of those quick games that you can bring to the table. It's easy to teach, so it's something to do, but yeah, it didn't wow me. Yep. Yeah. Well, uh, we are going to go right into uh, the Babel topic in a second, but uh, tell us a little bit, Dan, about what you've been doing in the pandemic time, and, and I know it's been different for all of us, not being able to go to all the conventions and you know, I know you had some employment disruption and different things too, but you know, you're you're immersing yourself in creating content. Tell us a little bit about all that. Yeah, I mean, I've been impacted um, much like I mean, I, I think everybody in the world's been impacted in different ways, and, and I'm no different, right? I I uh, up until last year, I was doing the channel not quite full time, but kind of full time. I was spending about. 30 hours ish a week running the channel, but I also had a full-time engineering job. Uh, and last year with the pandemic, uh, there were some things that happened and the, the company sort of went away. So uh, I've been doing the channel full-time since last August. And uh, so, so that's been doing that. But also during the pandemic, I invested in some new equipment and was able to stream. And I did a lot of streams right when the quarantine hit, uh, mostly playing games that the audience can play along with me, roll and rights and things like that, where people could just print out a sheet that I put online and they were literally playing along with me. Uh, huh. and they were saying their scores at the end. And I even had uh, Bruno Catala on once where we played a two player game called Naya and had a, a live interactive polling system where people were, were voting on their phone what move to make next. And whatever the audience majority was, they were playing against Bruno live, which I thought was really fun. Hmm. Yeah, that's What's really cool. Nice. Hmm. <laughs> Bruno Cathala, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so th that's and so yeah, just been diving into continuing to create content and trying to find different ways. And also, I've found myself since not being able to get together with the game groups often, found myself going back to a lot of older games that I hadn't played in a long time, and 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 found myself going, wow, I forgot how much I love this game. So I had started a series recently called the best games I forgot about. And it's called oh. Redisco Rediscovered Treasures. I've done about seven or eight of them. I'm actually in the middle of filming one right here on the other side. As soon as I'm done with this, I'll finish filming next week's, uh, which, spoiler alert, it's a Bruno Cathala game, by the way. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, so I, I've been going over older games that I forgot I loved but are still somewhat available. They're not completely out of print, but they're a little harder to find than most games. So. And then once I run out of a bunch of these, I'm going to do a series on games that I've found that I've loved that are completely out of print and that will try to get an audience to give enough thumbs up to interest maybe a publisher of picking up some of these games. So yeah, yeah. that's been sort of the focus of the pandemic has been different, you know. I love that, though. I love that. And you I mean, also have your Kickstarter running. Oh, yeah. That just launched my annual Kickstarter. I cannot believe that this is season nine, that this will be the ninth year I've been doing this. It's it's wow. like a time warp. It's like a time warp. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, the Kickstarter is running. If, uh, if you've ever seen my content and you enjoy it, there's plenty of cool rewards to get there to help support me continuing doing what I do, which is teaching you how to play games without having to read the rules or finding games that you might not know about or even helping you stay away from games and waste money on games that, well, after watching my video, you realize <laughs> it's probably not for you. Well, what, uh, I mean, waste money the, on games. Yeah, this is <laughs> this is super exciting, Dan. I mean, B Barry just put it up in euros. Um, oh, yeah. What, sorry. What, what 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 is it in in U.S. dollars? There you go. Forty one thousand. I am so encouraged for you and so so uh, excited, Dan, to see see this Kickstarter take off like this for you, especially being this is much more of a career now and you're having to dedicate your livelihood to it. The amount of stress that that creates to do this hobby because you, you're doing it for a living, you know, it puts a whole different take to to the to the work that you do. And, and sometimes that pressure can get to a person. And so it's so, so exciting for me to see this thing taking off like this. And I personally, you've been doing, you've been pouring your heart into this hobby for years, uh, starting out with the Dice Tower. And honestly, I thought that your videos were some of the face of the Dice Tower for a while, you know, 
Tom and them, they did great videos too, but you are, you are a really pronounced video reviewer and, and have helped so many people learn about games and, and your rule schools. Man, I love your rule schools. That It's one of my first go-tos when I'm playing a new game. I want to watch your rule school video if you have one, and then I'll look at the rules. It's so much easier yeah. for me. <laughs> yeah, I've seen you. You've texted me a few times of you with the iPad there learning. They're like, hey, you're teaching me a game. But yeah, it's, it's, it's fun. Those are, those are the hardest videos I produce because, again, everything has to be perfectly right. The, the, the publisher and the designers both have to approve it, things like that. So those are the most time consuming and the hardest ones, but they're also, I think they can be the most beneficial for sure. Oh, yeah. And yeah, I've, I, done all, I've, I've done 200 of those now. I've taught 200 games on the uh, of rule schools I looked up recently. Wow. That's that's huge. I wouldn't uh, – I mean, you, you've been doing this for nine years, and one of the things that I love what you do too is they're always – I have – I have a lot of media friends and I love to consume content, but I just don't have time, uh, especially with, with game toppers. And, and so I feel a little out of touch sometimes, but ones that I always check out are your top tens. I mean, mm -hmm. those things are crazy awesome. I love your top 10. And for some reason, your top 10 seem to, I don't know, you pick some gems in there that, a lot of people aren't talking about for some reason, but then after I watch yours, I go, why isn't other people talking about this one? This one sounds really great, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I've had, I, I got a lot of that feedback last year also, at the, like the end of the year, best best categories. I did two videos in the year, one for the best games of the year, different categories, and then the top 10. And I, I did see a decent amount of comments of people saying, yeah, I haven't seen it. anyone else really mention some of these. They look really cool. So. I don't know. I guess you just you, you seek out games that look cool to you that you want to review, and some games just aren't going to appeal to other people, or some ones definitely fly under the radar. Like I'll give you a little tidbit. Last year was the that uh, <laughs> the the uh, micro macro crime city. It was like sort of one of those ones that flew under the radar from Pegasus Spiel. It was one of the coolest, unique, most original games I'd ever seen. It's like a crime solving, deductive game with a big map. It is amazing, and I think in North America it should be. It should be out now, but it really was barely coming out at that time. And that's like one of those ones that not a lot of people were talking about because they didn't have their hands on them yet. But I had specifically seeked that one out because it looked so different. Hmm. Yeah. I yeah, think well, that when, you're, when you spend a lot of time creating stuff, you have very little time to watch what everyone else is pressuring you to buy. Plus – you have different publishers contacting you who send you games which were, are totally off the radar. And that's why you have like a, a, a kind of a different palette and a different list to everybody else that is out there, yeah. um, which, which is always good because, I mean, variety is, is the spice of life. Right, right. Yeah. And I, I, think, uh, I think a lot of times a lot of people know that I, I, I tend to do a lot of things with like sort of medium weight games or family games and things like that. But – you know, there were some pretty, you know, medium heavy games on there like Arnak and it's Lost Ruins of Arnak and things like that last year. So and Whistle Mountain, that is not a light game by any any stretch of the means. So I don't mind the the games that take a little longer, that are a little heavier. It's just the longer the game is, the better it really has to stand out for me to really focus mm. on. It needs yeah, to was, hold your interest. I was actually going to make that comment too. You seem to seem to settle in on that family weight type of game, not just simple easy i mean you you focus on high quality games you know and i remember you telling me about the crew oh Bert, you gotta try the crew and sure enough i went and, and look what that's it. done oh Is that uh, right it's yeah awesome. i mean i i and i think it's a it's, it seems to be an industry trend which i like is that more and more developers, designers, and publishers are streamlining things as much as possible. And I think that is only good for the games. It's going to, it makes the experiences better. It makes you, uh, it just, the tightness of the games are getting more and more. And they're getting, they're getting more efficient in that way. And I think that's a good thing because I tend to love games that don't have a whole lot of extra mechanisms going on. But with those simple mechanisms, there's so much depth. That tends to be my sweet spot. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you do a great job with that, and uh, uh, like I said, you've been you you're one of the hardest working guys in the hobby. When convention season is running, I mean, you are everywhere. You are tightly scheduled, meeting with tons of people, influencers in the hobby. 
So your hand is involved in many things and you do the homework, you do the work, you create high quality videos. They're not just slapped together. They're not thoughtless. Uh, and uh, your recommendations are always well taken. And uh, I don't always agree with you, but, <laughs> 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 but mostly I do. So um, <laughs> he's, he's not mostly dead. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you really deserve uh, all that's happening for you here. I'm so happy for the Kickstarter. How can people find you at the Kickstarter and so forth? Uh, you can just go to Kickstarter and search for Game Boy Geek, or you can just go to GameBoyGeek.com, and the, the landing page will bring you right to the Kickstarter. Awesome. Well, we're going to move right into our babble topic now. And now it's time for the Babble 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 Berkey and Badger's Board Game Babble. Hey, 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 ba 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 babble. I'm babbling in the chat. We're talking about comics, so. <laughs> See, there's a lot of fun that goes on behind the scenes when you join us live at Berkey and Badger. You don't yeah. get all this fun on the iTunes audio podcast. <laughs> no, no, you don't get to see those rats nibbling on that box behind you. They just it just crawled into your mat again, the blue one. It's the blue one. Go on, get get your swatter and swat it. <laughs> He's got well, glasses on. That rat's got glasses on. Anyway, we're, we're going to be talking about go big or go home. Give us a little little bit of uh, intro to what we're going to talk about there, Sir Badger. Okay. No, the A team. No. Um, <laughs> as time goes by, more and more games are getting the anniversary edition or the Kickstarter Deluxe Edition. Uh, these games are evidently nicer version nicer versions of the original games and come in larger boxes and and we're going to dive into a box full of babbling about larger boxes hmm. aren't we he said larger nice. boxes larger boxes yeah. we like large boxes of pieces of eight that are chocolatey the beat box the beat box <sighs> Yeah, Music Dan could do a better job of that. <laughs> all right. Well, we're going to talk about all kinds of different things. First thing I think we should talk about is sizes of boxes. We can talk about the other stuff a little bit more in depth. But one of the things that I think has been most commonly thought is that we like to see a more standardized box in the hobby, whether it's a ticket to ride size box or what we might refer to as a Z-Man size box uh, type of thing. And when companies are creating irregular boxes, it seems to get a fair amount of backlash or if they're making tins or something weird. What do you guys think about that? No, I mean, I agree with you. I, I love the ticket to ride size box. It's, I think that's the, that's the go-to. Um, Tins, yeah, they, they they're kind of a pain in the butt. Although they do look nice if they're on the shelf and they're not cracked and they don't they don't come open and spill out everywhere. Like right. the Forbidden Island, the Forbidden Island box looks great. Um, but also, what happens is, you know, you have games where the box is like maybe a Z-Man size box, a sort of rectangle, but it's like it, inside is like one deck of cards, and it's like, well, why is this box so large? Well, because it stands out on the shelf, and they wanted to spend the extra money on the box because it actually will attract some attention on the shelf. So there's so much that goes into things like this that we don't necessarily think about uh, when we're in the store or when we're you know, looking at the game. Mm. Yeah, I always find that a little bit off-putting. You know, when I open up a box and there's this cardboard insert that's worthless just to take up the space. You don't know whether or not there's going to be an expansion and there's a reason they're giving you a bigger box, but it looks like it's just trying to create perceived value and, and that look for the cover art on the, on the shelf. Um, yeah, I have kind of mixed feelings about it. I don't get too hung up about it, but. Hmm. 
Yeah, I think that's the, the, what you were going back to, the conformity. Everything wants to be a ticket to ride size box. And if it's not got as much components, then they'll they still do it. They'll still make it that size just so it can sit on the shelf next to ticket to ride. And then when you're looking at games to teach people, you go, oh, ticket to ride here. But, oh, there's this game. But uh, no, I, I used to have a problem with box sizes. I don't care anymore. Um, I like tins. The Fallout tin is good. As you said, I'm looking at the um, the the island, Forbidden Island, yeah. Forbidden Desert, sorry. And it looks nice stood up on its own. Unfortunately, it doesn't work with like the smaller timeline ones. You have to put them into a box and hide them. But the, again, right. they're beautiful boxes. They're they beautiful are. art. And they stand when they stand on their own, they look nice, but they take up so much space. But uh, box sizes doesn't bother me anymore it's just the the fun of the game if the game is good i don't care about the box size that means i'm going to buy concordia soon doesn't it <laughs> <laughs> well i think that's that's part of it you know i have i've got kind of a creative bookshelf solution is back in the day when we had the square tvs everybody had these home entertainment centers you know and they were large with stereo stacked uh shelving and then the square hole in the middle with cupboards on the bottom and they're on wheels and a lot of times made out of natural oak and that's the decor of my basement. Well, I bought a bunch of these, uh, three of them. Uh, so that's a kind of a bunch. <laughs> um, at rummage sales Great. for 50 bucks, these huge pieces of furniture, but they work great for board game shelving. But a lot of folks have calyx shelving and the cubicles, like Dan, behind your backdrop, you have Calyx shelving, I think. Mine right? are the uh, IKEA Billy bookshelves. Mm. Okay, so I got, little... I got those ones because the the shelves are a lot more adjustable, and so when we have an off size box, I can go, <laughs> okay, this whole section has to get adjusted because now I can fit all these different weird size boxes on this shelf. Ooh, the disdain in your voice there. <laughs> well, see, that's the problem, though, isn't it? It's like. I have those adjustable little pins that you're able to put in right. so you can adjust the shelves. And I've actually made a couple extra shelves so that I could could avoid that having to pull out a whole stack of games and trying to get one out, you know, that type of thing. Um, I know there's different shelving solutions out there now too with Box Throne and some others, but it's like when you get the irregular box, it doesn't fit right. And when it doesn't fit right, I look at it and I go, oh, that box is a half an inch taller. It doesn't fit in there right. It, it, I don't like that. <laughs> I want them all to be the same. <laughs> so anyway, that's the thing with, with uh, uh, boxes. Um, but I, I've noticed a trend that the boxes are getting bigger and bigger, especially thicker. They're mm -hmm. growing in space. And it's because we're seeing so many deluxified and or anniversary editions. Uh, well, uh, we're just seeing that the, the publishers are actually putting a lot more love and care into their games. You know, instead of just giving you wooden tokens, they're actually giving you minis. And so they, they're bigger, they take up more space. They, again, the minis need protecting or they're giving you thicker player boards with recesses in. So yes. there's, there's all these things. The publishers are starting to, you know, know what we like and know what's functional and, and know what kind of elevates their game a bit more and so they're they're putting that into the box and therefore the boxes are starting to get a bit more uh, chunky around the sides like me <laughs> so what do you think about that dan do you like do you like the bigger boxes full of all of the expansions and all the deluxified it, it depends if it's a game that i know i love i think it's great if it's a game that i haven't played yet before if it's, it's if it's the first time it's coming out and it has all this personally me i'm just gonna wait because i know that there's uh, there's other games that i know i love um i'd rather i'd rather have an upgraded version of a game i know i love than getting a super crazy version of a game i haven't even played yet hmm. I, even, if I, it looks, even if it looks really cool and it has all this crazy stuff, you know, the, the, these days I'm being more like tried and true wins over just the look of something. Yeah. And, and all of the inclusive, all the completionist type of stuff. Yeah. You know, I had, I had, uh, I ended up trading for this uh, actually with a friend of mine, but it was when Carcassonne 
Um, and I ended up getting the Carcassonne big box. Yeah. So I've got all these expansions in there, but the truth is I've never played a lot of those expansions. Yeah, I have the Carcassonne big box too. I, I really like it. And yeah, I've played, I haven't played all of the expansions, but I played most of them at least once just to see which ones I like. Um, but again, with that box, you, if, if that spills at all, then the different expansions mix with each other and then it's a, it's a real mess. <laughs> right? It's the same with the small one, though. I've got the small but I bought the individual boxes. And where I've made space by throwing some of the old boxes out and condensing them into one big box, you're still going to have spillage. It That's doesn't a good, matter what you do. It's a really good point, though, because uh, I have Alhambra, the big box version also. <laughs> you know, these are these big honking boxes, so they don't fit mm. in the shelves. They have to go up on top of the shelves, yeah. you know, to, to fit them, um, you know, because they're a ti4 type of size box i mean te, you know twilight imperium size box and um or i i think when they when they it would be nice if they actually had compartments that maybe had lids or something that kept the expansion separate so that you didn't have that problem where you could unbox them a little at a time i think when when uh, viticulture came out and then the tuscany expansion yep the insert the tray yeah that kind of yep. separated it a little bit so that you could unbox it in modules so to speak yeah yeah exactly and again um outlive the deluxe edition all the components come in their own boxes so you open your big box and then you've got all these little small boxes where oh there's the ammunition or oh, there's the the food what do you, tell me what you guys do with this. This is something that always drives me nuts. And, and I, I just had this happen the other day. Uh -oh. um, but you get the deluxified version, and it, now it's got the upgraded wooden bits, and it's got the, you know, maybe it has coins instead of the cardboard coins. But then they include in the game a whole bunch of cardboard coins and cardboard components. <laughs> they did this in the Dwellings of Eldervale. And I remember when they did it with uh, Orleone, one of my favorite games. And I couldn't throw away those, those cardboard pieces for some reason. <laughs> well, what if I need these for extras or... Do you have any? <laughs> yeah, no, I, I keep them too. Ye yesterday I got in the... Um... Unicorn Fever uh, from mm -hmm. Horrible Guild, you know, the one with all the big unicorns. And, yeah. and, and it came with the, the huge painted unicorns that look amazing and all the gold coins and all the wooden pieces. Oh. But they actually sent an additional second box that's the same size as the base box to keep all of the extras and Kickstarter extras and stuff. So now there's, there's basically two boxes. Now, for me, that's not a problem because the way I store my games, I like to look at the art shelves, so I have everything facing up, as you see in the back of my videos. My whole entire collection is my libraries like that. So I just put the second box behind it. So that's not that big a deal for me. But for others, okay. if you stack them in other ways, it's it's going to eat up some of your space. But I don't know, Berkey. I, I tend to keep the those the, the normal stuff in addition to the to the collectors just in case. I don't know. I do, I do too. Like uh, Kabuki Kid makes a point here on Orleone Deluxe and keeping the cardboard bits because you need them for some different modes of play. Um, I, a lot of times, am substituting components with my higher end resource, you know, Stunmeyer uh, tokens sometimes also. So it's like, but I, if you're going to a convention or something, and you want to take a game with you, you don't want to take all the big heavy duty upgraded components sometimes. Yeah. And, or if you're consolidating your games into a small package for travel or, so I'm the same way, but I did throw away those breaking game extra pieces because I had all the deluxe pieces in the big box. And, but yeah, I should probably yeah. go pull them out of the garbage. <laughs> I'll tell, tell you what's sad. I got, when I got Jamaica, I got a few extra boards that weren't supposed to be in there. So I have like a shed load of gold pieces for Jamaica and I've kept them all. You know, they don't, they don't sit in the tray. They, 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 they actually all over the place. They're underneath the box in, in underneath the insert and they're in with the cannons and they're in with the food, but I don't care. <laughs> I've got extra gold. Well, the gold in that game looks really nice anyway. Yeah. Everything looks nice in that game. It's just, 
I got well, extra and I didn't throw it away. <laughs> do you guys think it's a big benefit to get the big box version uh, versus buying the base version, getting the expansions, blah, blah, blah? I think it's, it depends. Hmm. I mean, there's giant versions too, right? Like I want to yeah. have to play the giant version of Azul and I'm like, okay, they're just bigger tiles. What? I, I don't get it, right? <laughs> <laughs> but 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 then you can play a giant version of like King Domino Time. where like the dominoes are so big now that there's actually little pieces of art in the dominoes that I never noticed in the base pieces. Mm. All these little things going on. I'm like, now that's cool. Right? So okay. I think it depends. Yeah. I mean with the the, the, the giant as all you could not play the game and just tile your bathroom if you need to. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of funny you bring up that because these big Big games that were, you know, really deluxified like Small World mm. when they made with the big wooden tiles. And that was awesome. I did that, like that version. I, I wish that was one that I wish I actually got because, you, you know, after that thing ended, they were going for what eight hundred dollars online, and, and it it was amazing. And it had all the expansions and all those things were wood. And, oh man, that is one that I regret not getting. I, I, I saw somewhere recently that it was like twenty five hundred dollars. It's crazy. You know, yeah, and I don't, they're never gonna bring that back like that again. I, I I don't know this for sure, but I remember hearing someone saying like they they you know from a profitability standpoint, it wasn't it wasn't a good decision. Uh, mm. It was more of like doing something for the fans, type to speak. Well, mm. I mean, my daughter's Gabrielle's favorite game is Takanoko, and they made that great big box with mm -hmm. you know yep. the big bamboo and all of that kind of stuff, and the bigger pandas. And yeah, they uh, brought that back recently. They did, okay. like in the last year or two, they brought that back. I think it was like it was like three hundred bucks or something like that for that big wooden box full of it. Yeah, I I think that stuff is cool, but boy, it's big big money. Yeah, mm. if it's if it's one of my top favorite games ever, I would I would probably do it. But if it's not, mm, I don't know. I can't, it's hard to justify that cost. Yeah, apart from the fact you probably play it more than you would the normal game because you wouldn't have to look on your shelves; you'd just be tripping over it every time you walked into your studio. Because it doubles as your coffee table. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it, it's pretty impressive though when you bring out a big game like that with friends and and. Yeah. And everyone is like, ooh. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, even you're going to need a game topper because this coffee table is too small for it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Well, I think we've talked about this quite a bit. I don't know if, you know, it. I think the consensus is, is that sometimes it's better uh, to get everything together. Sometimes uh, it's just a matter of having more stuff in the box that you may or may not use. Would you guys agree with that or – yeah, but one of the things that you had you had on, on the on the docket on the docket today was like, if you do get a bigger version, do you keep the original version you had? And for me, again, it depends on the game. Like, for example, the extra large code names that I bring to big groups and gatherings because everyone's standing around the table and everyone can see it a lot better. Yes, mm -hmm. I keep the original because on a day to day basis, or if I want to play it, I don't want to bring it to a convention. I want to bring it somewhere. I could just bag that up and throw it in a in a in a in a you know in a backpack, and so mm -hmm. I have the normal version for most of the time, but I have the bigger version for when I have, you know, the, the bigger get-togethers. Um, but then on the other hand, you know, you have games like the the, the new society, the Cleopatra, the Society of Architects, um, which was that humongous, you know, temple and all these pieces. I mean, that thing was huge last year. And in that case, I didn't keep the original because the game had been developed so differently that it was essentially a much better game, and so I didn't need to keep the original for that reason. And that was already a pretty big box anyway. But yeah, yeah, yeah. I uh, go on, go ahead. Go on. Go well, on. I just, I, I think, I think my game playing time has suffered the last few years, and so I feel a little. I'm, I'm having a hard time getting to play a lot of the games that I do like to play, and then and games that I know that I like, I usually will buy the expansion but I don't always get to play the expansion. I'll unbox it and then I'll generally put the expansion in the box, but I'll use Ziploc bags and I'll write on them that yep. this, these are expansion pieces. And, but I oftentimes don't actually get to play the expansion. 
And so they're in the big, they're in the box, but sometimes they don't fit in the box, right? Yeah. yeah. And then, then, we, then you've got to have two boxes. Well, I hate that. Me too. <laughs> so in that case, I want that bigger box so that I can put it all in one box. But then, you know, you won't believe this. I, I should have just given you a picture up in my office. I have four large cardboard boxes. And I mean, I'm talking 30 inch by 30 inch big cardboard boxes full of expansion boxes. It's like I can't get rid of them. I, I know I should just throw them all away, but I you know I'm going to put them on the wall or I'm going to. Bert, I, I got what, a solution for you. What? All you got to do is take some scissors and cut the very front oh. of the box so it's flat. And put yep. that in with your with your base game and throw the rest of the box out so you can still see the art of the, the front of the box of the expansion, but it's not taking up all the space. And so you just put it inside the box? Yeah, so I'll, I'll just cut like the very front cover of the box off so it's flat, and then I'll yeah. just put that in the base box because it's only like, you know, a quarter inch thick or whatever. So do you do that with all of yours? All expansion boxes. I cut off the front and I throw the rest away. Maybe I got to do that. I just, Good I advice. never know if I'm going to, you know, get rid of a game and then I want to give the person the box and, but I got all these boxes sitting there. It's just like driving me nuts. It's like you got the space for it. That's I can well, say. it's like, it feels like a disorder. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad he was the one to say it. <laughs> all right. Well, we're going to go through our top five big box games and we're gonna we'll 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 start with badger then we'll go to dan king and then we'll go to myself and was there anything else about this topic that you guys wanted to touch on no we can jump right in yeah jump right in all right um so badger you can start on off i've ranked okay. mine uh top five so i haven't ranked mine because i wasn't sure if it was our best top five or just five games that we want to talk about, which come in extremely large boxes. Yeah. Well, I rank so mine, but you do whatever you want. So it's, it's best, yes? Best. My okay, favorite. Best. My favorite is the way I did it. it okay, my way. favorite. Okay, I, I, I'll change my list as I go. <laughs> um, <laughs> my big box game is more than one, but that's another thing. I didn't know if it was just had to be one box or it could be many big boxes. Because Batman Gotham City Chronicles comes in oh. two big boxes. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's a lot of space. I mean, for, for one game. But it's a big box of lots of minis, of lots of components and chits. But it is one of these games that I love playing. I love the mechanisms. I love this kind of energy management system with a kind of miniature combat. Um, which you can play one on one or play a group against one. Um, it's in the Batman universe, and there's nothing else I really should say about this game because it's just, uh, uh, it's a personal favorite of mine. Yeah. Batman Gotham City Chronicles. Too much space yeah. because there's like seven boxes over there now, plus yeah. lots of little miniature add on booster packs, which are all over the place, plus an extra board, which is just sat in the box that it was delivered in from Kickstarter. Taking up too much space, but it's worth it. Yeah, for me, number five. It's one I alluded to earlier. It is the the XXL version of Codenames and Codenames Duet. I have a weird box for this though because I got one of the. I, I was fortunate enough to get one of the first boxes that were ever made for this, and they shrunk it since then. This one was like made for the retailers, where it had Codenames, Codenames Duet, and Codenames Pictures XXL all in one humongous giant box. And so yeah. I have all that. Excels all in one big box, and again, it's it's great because when you go to a big party, you can bring out this big box, and everyone can see the cards from standing around the table. Uh, so it allows you to play code names with a huge group, and that's why I love it. Yeah, I've seen you do that one. It looks really cool. Uh, my number five is going to be a little bit of a cheat here because it's not something that's readily available yet, but I've had the opportunity to get a prototype of it. Um, and it maybe it's a little unfair, but I love this game so much. This is Emerson Matsuchi design, the new game from Arcane Wonders that will be coming out this summer uh, in fulfillment from their Kickstarter, Foundations of Rome. Mm. 
there you see the mat. The, the actual box that I have is a custom made box that they put together and it, on the back it says prototype. But this box was so big, we were at the Dice Tower, uh, uh, at the Carib Royale two years ago and Emerson Matsuchi had this box and he was carrying it around. It, it took up his whole, his whole torso. The box is so big. It's a great big square. And we go to the dinner restaurant with Tom Vassell and Brian Pope and a couple of the guys. And he's got, and Emerson's got this great big honking box and he's bringing it with, and it takes up a chair because you don't want to get it, the prototypes in there. You don't want it to get it damaged, you know. They only made like five of these. Well, they sent us one of these and we've been able, we're able to play test the game and play it over and over. We love this game. Um, I, I can't wait till it comes in because now the actual production value, they actually have trays in there for all the different painted uh, foundation of Rome buildings and all this kind of stuff. And even though it's that great big honking box, I am so sick, excited about it. So. <laughs> Me too. Rick as well. <laughs> yeah. That, yeah. I can't wait to play that one. I haven't played it yet. Oh, uh, big fun. Big, big fun. I, I think yeah, it'll be right down your alley. All right, Sir Badger. Okay, back to me. Uh, I'm going to cross out that one as well because, yeah, I've played it a couple of times, but I don't know if I like it still. Um, <laughs> you will never know what that game is. Um, <laughs> game I've just been playing recently, uh, and I spoke about recently, on well, my last show, in fact, um, is very big box. I mean, it's not big, the biggest one on this list. Um, but it's Matches of Madness, second edition. Mm. It's a big, fat box. It's the same size as a ticket to ride, but it, as I said, it's like that. Uh, and again, it's one of those games which has got lots of space in it. So it's like, why? Just for the packaging and stuff. And it didn't protect the minis because the minis are, don't stand on the stands. But this is a, a big box game, and you could probably easily squeeze all your expansions in, much like you can do with like Imperial Assault as well um it's a solo app game at the moment for me but you can play it with up to about five players and you're exploring a mansion and it is a great implementation of an app with a board game um which is a, a kind of a murder mystery escape room game with some combat um and it's set in arkham what else could you not love <laughs> apart from uh, yeah. maybe a, a real kind of Cthulhu box, you can like put your hand in the box and your hand actually goes into another dimension kind of thing, but um, that's a bit too big a box I haven't been able to play that yet, but we got a buddy that has it, that him and his wife love it, and so we're hoping to get that to the table sometime in the near future but then know how it ends and so they, it'd be hard for them to play that's the only problem is replayability ah. hmm. <laughs> Anyway, my, my next one is one that I talked about earlier because it was just fresh on my mind is the giant version of King Domino. And okay. mostly because, again, the art on those dominoes really pops when the dominoes are so big. There is so many things going on in, in those dominoes that I never even saw before. And there's just all these little details that pop up in the artwork when you're when you're now playing King Domino. So for me, it's the giant King Domino is the next one. Hmm. Yeah, that's a fun game. Did they make a giant queen domino too? No, they this far. Oh, you know what? I think you're right. I think they did. I, I they. I was looking at that just last the other night, and up until this point, I didn't think there was one, but I think they did make one. I'm gonna double check for you, Berkey. I have it still on my shelf of shame. I, I like King Domino, and then I actually talked to Bruno at Gen Con the year before last when Queen came out. Um, and, and interviewed him actually for a little bit and, and I bought it and there it sits. <laughs> that drives me nuts. Well, it's definitely <laughs> like a more sort of like gamers version of, yes, they do have a giant version of Queen Domino. Okay. Oh, okay. Cool. Interesting. All right. My number four, um, uh, Kabuki Kid beat us to the punch on this in the chat. She talked about it, but it's the 10th anniversary Ticket to Ride. Uh, my wife loves Ticket to Ride, and this 10th anniversary edition 
was so amazing because it included the 1910 cards. All of the cards are much bigger, regular cards instead of the smaller cards. Um, I did still keep the original versions, interestingly. <laughs> Actually, no, I didn't. I gave it to my daughter, Maddie. Um, and I have the, the big box and I actually picked up a ding and dent where the box was damaged for 20 bucks and everything was perfect inside that my other daughter, Hannah has of the 10th anniversary, but the trains, they each come in these little tins with these amazing cool trains. The only problem is those trains are just a little bit too big to play on all the expansion maps. I still do it but they're, they're the best. Uh, and those 1910 big cards and uh, just the artwork of that great big honking box, it's up on the top of my shelf facing out. And I don't know, I love that. Yeah, it's a trap. It's a trap, <laughs> it's a trap. <laughs> All right, you're number three, so. Okay, um, this is a big box. Um, that's done. That's done. One, two, three, there's three left. Yeah, this is a big box. I was going to say, actually, Dan, you did point out a good thing. Uh, code names. Yeah, big box. I've, I've just realized I've got the big version and small version, but one's in English and one's in French, so uh, I'm covered. But um, <laughs> it didn't make my list. Um, this is a big box, but it's only for two players. It's a chunking big box. It's the same size as one of the Batman boxes. This is same company, Claustrophobia, 1643 by uh, monolith um big big box with lots of components which again it's one of these boxes which is well stacked um everything is well laid out so everything's easy to get in everything's easy to take out a fantastic two-player game where one player is controlling a bunch of heroes and one player is controlling all the monsters and it's scenario based and it is really really tense this back and forth between who's gonna who's gonna win who's gonna achieve their objectives um but it's a big box for two players you know unlike the kahuna which is about that big this is kind of like makes me wonder really should i keep it but i enjoy it so claustrophobia right. and it's got a good soundtrack as well <laughs> yes my next Maybe one is one that. <laughs> Uh, my next one's one that I mentioned earlier as well is the uh, Cleopatra and the Society of Architects. Ah, and that you is got the, the new one. The new one with the the, the fully painted one is crazy. Ah. It's it's amazing, and the game is so much better than it used to be. So, all the pieces, all the oh my gosh, it's crazy. This thing, I mean, it, it does take a little while. To, it's a puzzle taking this thing out and putting it back together and making the box shut, but. At least there's some diagrams, and after you've done it a few times, you kind of know how everything goes. And so it's not too bad, but it's also one of those ones because it takes so long to set up, it probably won't, doesn't come out as often as it normally would. But it is a really cool – It's I, I don't have any other game in my library that causes that much ruckus when it's set up and somebody just walks by it because it's like, what is this thing? <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny. I had, I have almost all of the Days of Wonder games, but that one we didn't have, and I ended up getting it in a trade – the old version. And we just played it here, I don't know, six months ago or so. And we went, why haven't we played this game? We had so much fun with it. Oh, and then then you'd like the new one. I think the new one gameplay is night and day difference. I think it's so much better. They, they redeveloped the game so well. Huh. Cool. There's a All lot that. of changes mechanically to the game that make it a lot better. Wow, really? Uh, we really enjoyed it. So that's awesome. All right. Well, I have... Um, Another game that um, I love so much. Uh, I love the art. Uh, this game was successful, I think, based on the art. And then people came along and saw the actual game. Um, this game has a bunch of expansions. Um, I love it so much. I had a dream one time about the art of this <laughs> game. And I actually contacted the owner of the company and sketched out this drawing that I saw in this dream of mine <laughs> because I was thinking about it um, and actually asked him if we could make a game map for it. And this is the game Scythe. Mm. Um, I had this idea in this, this kind of little dream of mine where they had these 
a mech unit station out in the cold winter being built, you know, and they're in the snow in this pre-industrial grungy environment and the oil production and the minefield. And, and I was a little nervous even at approaching Jamie. I had met him a couple of times, but I said, would, would it be okay? I've got this idea. I can have my artists do it, but I, I love this game so much. And uh, he kindly uh, allowed us to do that without even a royalty fee, just saying this is an official Stonemeyer game project. And people love this uh, map. And when you see Scythe uh, with the airships and, and all of the miniatures and the environment of this game, I have it prominently display, displayed. And like you're saying, Barry, lots of boxes, mm -hmm. but big chunky cardboard that it makes it worth it. I have the Meeple Reality uh, uh, organizer for it, but it doesn't accommodate, it accommodates some of the expansions, but not all of them. So I still have to have uh, some, and I have the one expansion that I haven't played yet. Uh, the last, what was the last one? The campaign one? Uh, yeah, what, what was it called? It's sitting uh, yeah. right on the shelf. I can see it in my head, but um, <laughs> um, not the airships. Uh, my little scythe. <laughs> no, I did get the that. That's on, my, that's on my shelf of shame, too. <laughs> well, anyway. Um, yeah. Uh, I, the, rise, the Rise of Fenris. The Rise of Fenris. Um, I haven't actually been able to get that to the table yet. But anyway, scythe, got to love it. Stonemeyer Games, amazing production. Great big honking box. I think I could use a bigger honking box. Mm -hmm. Do you have the big board for that one too? Yeah, the big board in there and the big neoprene mat. So, yeah. Okay. Mine is probably the oldest, one of the oldest games that I have. Um, my biggest game at that a long time ago was Hero Quest. But this game came out and it was a box which is twice the size, well, twice as wide. Um, and it had the same kind of name. It was Hero Scape. Uh, it had chuck bucket loads of bits in there. Lots of large plastic terrain tiles, colorful uh, minis and cards and dice and tokens, plastic ones, no cardboard chips or anything. This was, uh, for its time, a stellar production, and it was jam-packed into this box. Um and then that forced you to buy some more boxes and some more boxes. And so it is probably the largest box. That, no, it's about the same size as Batman. Well, I've got large, big Tupperware. Well, two large Tupperware boxes underneath this te this telly here. And uh, it's all filled with my hero scape. Very large. Hmm. Cool. I figured you'd, you'd count that one. Yeah. Uh. I uh, I my didn't. next I, one I, is I, a is a huge box with a gazillion tiles and a big tower called Suburbia Collector's Edition. Ah, that very is nice. a very big and heavy box. Tons and tons and tons. It has every expansion in there. Had a new expansion in there. Uh, had all redone art. And Suburbia is one of my favorites. It's such a great economic tile laying game. I mean, huge. I love huge. economic games. Believe me when I say. One of the most luxurious games you've ever seen. Believe me when I say it. You'll love it. <laughs> I Huge. did want that. I loved playing Suburbia, but, you know, it was the, the building of the city was, was amazing. But when you looked at your city, you thought, oh my God, it's just green and blue. And it's like, Ugh. if only this had nice artwork. The and art's then they come awesome. Out. Yeah, the artwork is awesome. Unfortunately, it doesn't come in a, a small kind of normal size box. Does it have Maybe the Suburbia time. Inc. expansion with it? Yes, Suburbia yeah. Inc. Five Star and a new one called like ap, like late at night or after night or something like that, like a mm -hmm. like a night a night one a nightlife I think it's called. Nightlife. So yeah, yep, yeah, comes with both expansions and a new one. I like and all of, and all of the uh, the 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 promo tiles that had come with different conventions and stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay. Like the yeah. hard the hard to find promos they put in there too. Oh, yeah, and there's a, there's like a there's a jazz lounge promo tile from me from one of my <laughs> kickstars in there too. Really? Yeah. Cool. Oh, that's fun. 
Uh, my uh, second to last here is one of my favorite games. Uh, I have several boxes, but I have worked pretty hard to get it to fit in the main box, but I have so many expansions. And this is from Gale Force 9, and it is... Uh, live Long and Prosper. Live Long and Prosper. Star Trek Ascendancy with the Vulcans, with the Andorians, with the Cardassians, with the Klingons and the Simpsons, not the Simpsons. No, 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 okay. no, no, but the Federation's in there. The Romulans are in there. I mean, this the Ferengi. Yes, Quark. These tube grubs are chilled to perfection. I mean, <laughs> I love Star Trek. I love this game. It's the best Star Trek game ever. Um, but I've got the premium Gale Force 9 pieces with the little space stations and all the stuff. And I've got baggies upon baggies upon baggies to get that all fit in there. Um, oh, but I, I've kept all of the big boxes, all the expansion boxes, because the art is so amazing for each race. And I have a, a great big Star Trek, the Borg cube that you push the button and it makes the Borg sounds. And a Star Trek <laughs> Fraser. I've got a little Cardassian ship, and I've got them all set up on the top of my counter with all of that stuff. So it's a uh, love it, love, love. Yeah, love, and underneath love. your headphones, you got Vulcan ears. Yeah, we know, we know. Yeah, we know. yeah. And you're drinking Vulcan blood. So I'm go. drinking Vulcan blood. Good old green Vulcan blood. <laughs> love it, love it, love it. Star Trek Ascendancy. Oh. <clears throat> Last one on my list is a game I've just uh, spoken about. It's uh, a big box. It's a deluxe version. It's Outlive, the post-apocalyptic worker deplacement game. Mm. In this big box, you don't just have the bonus, well, the, the, the upgraded components. You have the basic components as well. So you have the small size board plus the big size board. You have the little meeples, which are wooden, and then you have the large plastic meeples. Um, everything's in there. It all comes in little boxes which is all colorfully arted as well. Um, it's a fantastic game. It's a game that I love playing, but I'm a worker placement freak. Um, and, and it's just a, a shame it's, it's a big box because it probably fit in a box a bit smaller. But apart from that, it's, it's a lovely game. Lovely game. Oh, then the expansion is not compatible <laughs> with this big version but luckily there's the small version in there so you can play the expansion with the small version so there's a mm. saving grace there so to speak mm. my last one is one that berkey already mentioned and it's the ticket to ride 10th anniversary edition ah. it's like one of my favorites in my entire library it, you can't get it anymore it's like mm. hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dollars online uh you have to wait another 10 years i guess <laughs> <laughs> or Not eight, long. eight eight years eight years uh less than that uh, so yeah, the same reasons that those trains, the ones with the giraffes poking their heads out. It's yeah. just the problem. The only problem with this game is, uh, I always bring it out a lot of times with people that haven't played ticket to ride before. And I show them the regular version afterwards and say, look, if you go get this in the store, this is what it will look like. Here's the cards. And sure. They always end up buying the regular one and they always call me back later and they're like, it was still really fun, but really, it didn't feel the same as that big version. You know, <laughs> so you, you gotta you gotta watch out. You know, and and the 1910 expansion is like out of print and hard to get, so it's hard to get people to get the normal size cards with the regular version. Mm. Uh, but two other comments on this: one is yes, the Europe version of their 15th anniversary is coming out, and that's going to be basically the same treatment: new trains, okay. big board, big everything. It's it just got announced uh, in the last week or two. I think I saw that. It's got the train stations and all that, and the yep. passengers. Yeah, so they that's coming out soon. I'm definitely going to get that. Uh, although, yes, the one thing that stinks is obviously, like you said, you can't use those trains and all the expansion maps. But I'm working on a Kickstarter video for an independent publisher who's coming out with a bunch of aftermarket trains that work in any train game, including Ticket to Ride. And I've seen some of these trains, and they're really cool looking. So you'll be able to use these on the regular Ticket to Ride board and expansions as well. Ah, what do you so think about it? Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, no, I was just saying, keep your eye on my channel because uh, in the next month and a half, I'll have a video up there about these these extras, like third party trains. Wow, I like that so, idea. What was your question? Well, what do you think about us making a train themed game topper game map? Yeah. 
That'd be nice. I have tons of training. I, I, I have a lot of training games. I think uh, I like those. I think that that would go over great. Yeah. Yeah. And then if you, you got an official map of the board game on your table, those trains would definitely fit in the space. <laughs> There you go. <laughs> uh, yeah. And if I had to pick another one, because you picked that one, I would pick Mechs versus Minions. That game is just okay. Yeah, a yeah. fantastic, humongo box of tons of miniatures and tons of minions and all sorts of goodness. Yeah, I didn't get that one. A buddy of mine got it, though, but I haven't played it. I hear good things about it. It's like 15 pounds, that box. Yeah. Well, I'm going to tell you my my favorite uh, first, and it's in multiple boxes because it doesn't fit in the one big box it comes in. But before I do that, I have an honorable mention. Oh, no. So, yeah, I'm breaking the rules, breaking all the rules. Again. Sorry. Yeah, uh, rebel. Uh, um, one that I'm really excited about getting uh, that I kickstarted is the big box terraforming Mars. Mm. I don't have it yet, so I didn't put it in the list, but I've got so much terraforming Mars stuff. I can't wait to get uh, the big, bigger box that came with all the new resource, all the 3D tiles and stuff. So I bought the 3D tiles and the bigger box, and I think that's coming out this summer. And so I'm really excited about getting that one, and I'm, I'm fine that it's in that great big honking box. So my number one is my number one favorite game. Can you guess yeah. what that is? Midgar. Blood Rage. Ah. Blood Rage. Yeah. So I, I backed the most recent Kickstarter with all the new expansions to Blood Rage and the better player boards. And now it has to go. I've got the gods of Asgard and all of the all of the extra ones. I have this really cool uh, insert for the whole thing. So I have two big boxes that are this thick. And uh, Rob Oren actually painted these for me uh, a couple years ago. And so it's my. I, I only have two games that are fully painted. Uh, Cry Havoc that Ron Shady painted for me and Blood Rage, and I love Blood Rage, and I love the miniatures, the way they all fit in all the different packets. Uh, now that I have that big expansion box, uh, you know, with all the pulling out all the components, I love it. Uh, it's two great big boxes, and if I could get it all in one great big box, I would be happier. And there I, had you have Rob, it. I had Rob paint my, Rob painted my whole side set too, actually. Oh, really? Yeah. I didn't dare. You know, the poor guy, he painted this set many times. Kabuki Kid just made a, a comment. This was a tedious paint when after you've painted it many times. And uh, I didn't have the heart to ask him to paint my uh, my new expansions that I have. So the, the new stuff, it's unpainted right now. <laughs> but, yeah, love Blood Rage. So that's pretty cool big box in my opinion. So we have talked about a whole bunch of big box games. Uh, maybe we'll put up a poll and talk about what other people have for their favorite big box games on our Board Game Geek Guild 2248. Right, Baba Badger? Yeah, possibly. Unless possibly. I fall asleep at the keyboard. Possibly. We'll see. <laughs> yeah. We'll see. Well, well, this has been super fun talking about Go Big or Go Home with our special guest, Dan King, the Game Boy Geek. And uh, Dan, again, thank you so much uh, for your friendship. Thanks for being on the show. And tell people where they can find you. And just again, just uh, refresh everybody about your upcoming Kickstarter, or your Kickstarter yeah, that's, that's running. Easiest way is just GameBoyGeek.com. You can find my Kickstarter there as well and, and all the other places that you might want to find me, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, you name it. Yeah, and the landing page is probably going to put you right to the Kickstarter where you can click through at the bottom and go right to the regular page. And then everything, yeah, you can find me in all different places. Awesome. Well, we wish you the best, Dan, and we hope uh, that Kickstarter just goes to the moon and really uh, sets you at another level so you can just do dedicate all your time to, to your hobby, and it would be really a lot of fun and enjoyable for you. 
Thanks, Berkey and Badger. <laughs> love I love coming on air. Love seeing you guys at, at conventions. Badger, I've only met you once at Gen Con, but it was the highlight. <laughs> 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 oh, he blushes. I feel, I feel bad that I didn't get you to play saxophone on the Chronicles of Crime soundtrack. Maybe See, next time. The noir, Maybe next time. yeah, the noir version would have been perfect. It would have been perfect. I'd have had to learn jazz though. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is a, a fun show. This will be produced in a audio format that's professionally edited by Sir Badger that'll have all kinds of fun music drops and all of that. So you'll be able to pick this up on iTunes and Stitcher. But you can also go to YouTube and find us at Berkey and Badger Board Game Battle Show or on Facebook or the Board Game Geek Guild 2248. Uh, Badger has his own website where you can also find past episodes. Yeah, board games everybody should and most importantly all the soundtracks which are coming out over the next couple of months oh cool well with that we're gonna take us all out of here thanks so much everybody for joining it was fun talking with you dan and badger uh you guys have a great week and uh, enjoy some board games bye bye We're so glad we had this time together And now it's time to go It won't be long until we have another show So keep us in mind, get online Berkey and Badger will be back in no time